Hi guys, this is jsnmall.com and I'm here with a phone called the AllView X1 Extreme Mini, which is a Romanian rebranded version of a Chinese phone called the Uni U2. It was launched in November 2014, at least the AllView version of the phone, and in China it costs $290, so it's an affordable Snapdragon 800 based handset. We have already tested the AllView X1 Extreme, and this is the X1 Extreme Mini, so it's its mini version. It's a strong selfie phone because it has a front ultra pixel camera with a metallic design that I'm going to discuss over the following minutes. The Uni U2 or the Allview X1 Extreme Mini as it's called has a thickness of 10.3 millimeters. It weighs 139.2 grams and it's pretty massive for a 4.7 inch phone. It has a uni body metal case as you can see right here. It has a slightly rounded back and the camera protrudes quite a bit from the back side. The design reminds me only a slight bit of the HTC One and also a bit of the iPhones. It comes in grey or green and is not very comfy for gaming because of its bulky nature and the squared design. Um, I have to say that the grip is quite good for this model and the one hand usage, as you can see, it's not exactly very good once again because of the thick nature of the device. I cannot exactly reach all the area as I could want on the screen or the facade easily. Uh, I should also mention that in Romania the AllView X1 Extreme Mini had a special edition that allowed you to engrave the back of the phone with a special message, special name and things like that. So this is an aluminum case, it's made from a singular block of alloy as far as I know and now let's discuss and analyze the design. Up front we have an earpiece right here at the top, we have notification LED here, sensors and front camera. There are also three capacitive buttons below the display, the home button, back button and menu button as usual. Now at the back we have the camera that's quite bulky and protruding, the flash below it, a microphone here, the AllView logo and a few more logos at the bottom. Next up at the top there is the audio jack and on off button with a pretty good feedback while uh, at the bottom we find the micro USB port, a microphone and what appear to be uh, two sets of speaker holes. On the left side there is the micro SIM tray that can be pulled out with a special metal key while on the right side there are the volume buttons once again with good feedback. This is a pretty massive phone for a device that has mini in its name. It's also bulky for a 4.7 inch handset but the build is pretty solid and the materials are premium. Now as far as the hardware is concerned, we are getting a 4.7 inch screen here. It's an IPS LCD Full HD with low temperature polysilicon technology and the processor is a quad core Snapdragon 800 clocked at 2.15 GHz. The GPU is an Adreno 330 clocked at 450 MHz and we also get 16 GB of storage, there is no microSD card slot in here and the quantity of RAM is 2 GB of Alpi DDR3. As far as the cameras are concerned, we get a 4 megapixel ultra pixel front camera and a 16 megapixel main shooter. On the connectivity side, this model offers GPS, HSDPA with a maximum download speed of up to 42 mega per second. There's a Bluetooth 4.0, Wi-Fi dual band, BGNAC, Wi-Fi direct, Wi-Fi display and micro USB 2.0. Now in the section we usually call and others, we got a Yamaha amplifier, accelerometer and proximity sensor, as well as a compass and light sensor. The battery available on this model, well it's a lithium polymer unit with a capacity of 2200 mAh. The charger that comes with the phone is a 5V 1000mAh unit and on paper this model is able to offer up to 11 hours of talk. It has a special SDI technology that can give you up to 30% more capacity and lifespan than regular batteries. We tested this battery and let's see what happened here. On paper it should provide you with uh, 220 hours of standby. So in our test with Wi-Fi on brightness of 50% and an HD video in a loop, we achieved 7 hours and 14 minutes with the screen on at all time. This is pretty much the same performance as the one of the HTC One Mini, 
I mentioned that phone because I find some similarities between them and were about one hour less than the Allview X1 Extreme which is the big version of this mini phone. That one has 8 hours plus, this one 7 hours plus. I would say that for video playback it's okay. With average usage you should get about one day or one day and a half and I find this standby time to be quite good. For example, if you leave the phone in standby during the night you'll only lose 2 or 3 percent which is a pretty good standby time while you're sleeping. The charging is a bit long, 2 hours and 40 minutes, but it's not exaggerated and it's also similar to the one of the X1 Extreme. Finally, if you go into the settings area and you're looking for special power saving features, there are none, so you have to deal without them. Okay, so overall it's an OK battery. Now we move forward to the audio side. We got Yamaha amplification, DTS support and we're going to use the Google Play Music app to play our tunes. So let's actually play some music speakers here Okay, one quick mention, although it may seem we have two speakers, this one is only for the purpose of design. We got one single speaker here, the one on the right side. The conclusion is that the volume is medium or better said mediocre, the bass is okay, clarity is okay and there is a slight bit of distortion when you're listening to a tune with guitars at maximum volume. As far as the equalization goes, if you go to the settings in the play app, you can find the regular options, equalizer here, stock options with uh, options related to genres, five custom channels, bass boost and surround sound, you already know those. And now let's have a look at the headphones. Those are the headphones bundled with the Uni U2, they look pretty much premium, they sit well in the user's ear. A defect can be the fact that this jack, this plug is a bit too long and it's not aesthetically pleasing, as you can see here. It gets out of the audio jack a bit too much, it's a bit too long. Anyway, the headphones themselves have a premium look, they're comfy, they're loud, clear, have an okay bass, an okay isolation. We got a discrete remote as well, that you can see right here. And sadly, there is no FM radio to use the headphones with. Okay, the headphones be gone now. And we're going to the settings area where we should find a special option that you're all wondering about, the DTS effect. So this effect can be applied while you're playing music. It enhances the focus, bass boost, 3D effects, we got space reverb, clarity, volume strengthen, and a few presets to get all of this going at the same time. Now, as far as the decibel count is concerned, we own and use a decibel meter, and we use that to test the device. So here we go. It doesn't matter if it's the back or the front of the phone, the speakers are at the bottom, but here we go, at the back 80.6 decibels and at the front 80.2 decibels. This is quite low, for example a handset I recently reviewed, a low-end handset, it's called P6 Energy from Allview, achieves 85 decibels. The iPhone 6 Plus 83 decibels, the Carbon Titanium X6 S6 from India 84 decibels, so I could go on and on. Many models achieve 85 decibels, we're stuck at 80.2 so the volume could be just a smidge higher. Okay, we're done with the acoustics. Once again, reasonably clear, decent bass, good headphones, but the, bright, but the uh, acoustics volume could have been a bit higher. Speaking of brightness, the display we got here, it's a sharp model, a sharp IPS LCD Full HD screen, a 4.7 incher with low temperature polysilicon and OGS. It offers a 469 ppi density and the low temperature polysilicon means that we get a better response time. We also have Gorilla Glass 3 protection and if you are patient enough to look to the apps, you'll find there is no video player, so you have to resort to the gallery to play your stuff. So let's play this video sample and analyze the performance of the screen. At first sight seems like a bright display a bit oversaturated, 
with wide viewing angles, but not hugely wide, decently wide. The images are very clear and the text looks great because of the high resolution on a relatively small screen uh, and the screen behaves a bit badly in full sunlight, there's a bit of reflectivity going on and the pixels are of the RGB stripe kind. Let's let the microscope do the talking now. We use the microscope and this is what the screen is like under the microscope. Now you're probably wondering about the lux level. We use the lux meter and on a white background we achieved 312 lux units. It's a bit below our expectations but not by very much. For example the Exxon Extreme, the enlarged version of this phone, achieves 337 lux and many cheap models that I reviewed recently go past 400 lux so maybe could have been just a little bit better. However with a day to day use I feel that the screen is at least a 360 lux unit. Once again a personal impression after day to day use. Um, I have to say that the games offer very vivid colors and if you're looking for special settings in the display area there are none as you can see here. We're done with the screen, pretty much ok but a bit more brightness would be welcome. Now as far as the camera goes there is a lot of numbers and letters to say so pay attention. You got a 60 megapixel sensor here with an LED flash, this is the Omnivision OV16825 sensor, it has a sapphire lens with an anti-reflection filter, also a UV and infrared filter. Um, this sensor measures about half an inch, uh, it was made in 2012, it uses Omni BSI2 technology and offers 1.34 micron pixels. On paper it's capable of 4K 60 frames per second capture but only on paper, it also needs a potent CPU to do that. At the front is the selling point of the phone, a 4 megapixel ultra pixel camera with 2 micron pixel size. It's the OV4688 from 2013 that, surprise surprise, it was used on the HTC One M7 and M8, some of the models, it was used as the main camera and here it's the front camera, so that's a compliment. The sensor size at the front is one third of an inch and it uses pretty much little power, so it's also good for consumption. Now as far as the camera UI is concerned, we got this little castle here, we got a very minimalistic interface that reminds us of the older Google camera options, you can see the options here and let's take them one by one. So option number one, we got HDR, very easy to activate and deactivate. Next up, first batch of options, we got scene modes with a bunch of sub options, quite a lot of them actually. And then we have store location, picture size, if you use 60 megapixels is 4 to 3 aspect ratio, 30 megapixels 16 to 9 aspect ratio. We got a histogram, picture quality, with JPEG options, super fine, fine and normal. We got uh, countdown timer, beep during countdown, volume keys options and then we got options part 2. Color effect, face detection, touch, touch, autofocus and auto exposure, saturation, contrast and sharpness, each with a few sub settings. And then round number 3 of options, anti-banding, ISO going up to uh, 1600, wavelet denoise, exposure, white balance, flash mode and focus mode with options like infinity, macro, normal or continuous autofocus. Ok, so those were the options, we got a front camera shortcut, we got a camera uh, reset option for the settings, if you switch to video, and by the way these are the capture modes, camera, video and panorama, now we're in the video mode, let's see the options here. Time lapse, video quality, you can film in full HD, 720p, 480p, there's also video encoder, H.263, 264 or MPEG4, we got audio encoder, two options including AAC, video duration, store location and anti-banding and even more options, color effect, white balance and finally flash mode. Then usual front camera shortcut and camera reset button. So those are the options you'll be playing with on this model. Ok, so I must mention that the front camera is able to film in Full HD, in case you want to take a Full HD selfie video, we got a pretty fast focus, as you can see, so if you move the camera around and then I focus, you see that the focus is fast, the capture is pretty slow, compared to the focus, it took me a while to take the shot, zoom goes up to 6 times 
and the front camera also has six times zoom and a fast focus as well so let's actually take a shot of this castle and analyze its level of details here we go the photo i just taken i would have to see that the level of details is quite good as seen in the text here and tower it takes about two or three zooms before the image gets noisy and blurry and once again pretty decent level of detail but we're using spotlights here so let's go to the gallery and view a series of shots taken during daylight and a pretty cloudy day i have to mention that with small spots of sun so first things first we got an okay level of detail and the first thing that you notice is that the HDR will add some extra color out of nowhere. This is the regular shot, pretty much normal and cold colors, but here everything becomes red because of the HDR, so that's strange. Some more shots, once again, good level of detail, if you zoom in. And this is another HDR sample, regular shot, too dark. This time the light pops up and some red hue also pops up, or better said purple. Let's see more samples. Now this is where the colors are starting. Pretty good colors. I said before that the colors are a bit cold. This is where they get a bit better. The colors become more vivid. And we got a pretty good macro here on this bare face. We need a poo. Very good reds. I don't exactly like the greens and the blues, but the reds are pretty much okay. Okay, so we also have this panorama here. I would say that it's a bit more blurry than I expected, especially if you view it on a computer. And once again, colorful shots, good colors. In case you're wondering what's the deal with these pics, I tried to tag them using the front camera as a back camera. They came out pretty blurry and this is a selfie shot to demonstrate the abilities of the front cam. As you can see the level of details is pretty good with the ultra pixel camera at the front. Okay, we proceed back to the back camera. Some shots taken under the bridge in a park and we use the flash to make a bit of a difference and it worked, the flash is quite good. Some more shots here, graffiti and such and some more colors and another attempt at the macro very good level of detail so when it comes to macros this handset doesn't disappoint i like the reds once again i don't quite like the blues and the greens of the phone get another example of macro coming here and here a landscape shot of a more detailed object the lighting became better here, some more selfie shots and strangely the blues look better with the front camera than with the back one. A lot of shots of monuments and such. This was in a very dark area and we tested the HDR yet again. This picture has been lit up compared to this one so HDR works fine sometimes and sometimes it makes the image a bit red but decently lit. We got good exposure, good white balance, a good focus, the images are crisp and clear and this is where I tested the zoom. So this horse is pretty far away, zooming level 1, level 2 and level 3 and still not much blurriness and loss of quality so that's pretty impressive. A picture with the sun in front of us and still no halo or problem so I would say we're doing pretty fine. Some more shots this time some yellow color overall the camera behaves pretty well for a 290 dollar phone however this is a 60 megapixel sensor so i expected a bit more from it for example the all x1 extreme had a brilliant camera some shots even made the galaxy s5 whip if i can say that however this one is 40 percent less performant than the x1 extreme now as far as the video is concerned it's all MP4, Full HD, 24 frames per second in spite of being promised 30 frames and a bitrate of 20 mega per second. So let's look up the videos. I'm going to start with this one, although it's a bit dark. We got poor stabilization, some focus problems. However, it has good acoustics because if you listen closely, you can hear my headphones and the music they're blasting. A bit dark, 
a bit poorly stabilized and some focus problems okay then comes video number two old colors again not so good stabilization again some minor white balance problems and then let's see video number three the headphones are hurt pretty well again some motion blur is happening here I decided to move the camera a bit faster motion blur appeared colors feel a bit washed out and we're testing the zoom quality which kind of drops a bit dramatically compared to the one from the photos and now the final shot the final video shot a globe a spinning yellow globe we got a pretty okay reflection this time we activated the stabilization and that can be felt there is no motion blur in spite of monitoring motion with the cards that are coming right now so overall the video capture is below the photo capture the images are cold um, they're a bit moved, they're a bit dark, but I like the acoustics and they were a bit of a surprise. Overall, this camera would be good for a 10 or 12 megapixel camera and for 2013, but in 2015, from a 16 megapixel camera, we want a bit more. It's not a stellar cam, but this is a $290 phone and it have to do for it. If I want to make a quick comparison, this camera is below the one of the HTC One Mini, but that's a quick comparison. In spite of that, we have a very good selfie camera at the front, so if you're selfie oriented, you'll love that. Okay, now as far as the photo editing is concerned, we pick a picture, press this button here, and we're treated to examples of filters like Instant, Latte, Blue, Lito, Punch, Vintage, some frames to apply. The usual crop, straight and rotate, mirror, draw, auto color exposure, vignette, contrast, shadows, highlights, curves, hue, saturation, black and white and negative. And that was the picture editing in a nutshell. We also tested the temperature of the phone after playing the game Riptide GP2 for 15 minutes. We achieved 38.5 degrees Celsius, so no, there is no overheating here. As far as the web browser is concerned, this is the stock web browser, we also have Chrome installed. Let's go to gsmdome.com. Reasonably fast, not the fastest in the world, but also not the slowest. The text looks very fine on this small screen with pretty big resolution. Full HD screen, 4.7 inch, fluid pinch to zoom. Looks okay also in landscape. And this is the stock keyboard available on the device, reasonably spaced. We move further to the phone area. I would have to say that the phone calls are pretty clear, volume is pretty much okay, but there is a problem here. The problem is with the 3G and Wi-Fi signal. I'm guessing it's the metal case somehow. I find the downloads to be very slow on Wi-Fi and on 3G. And no matter where you're placed compared to the Wi-Fi router, you'll see that the Wi-Fi is kind of slow, which is not very okay. Once again, maybe the fault of the metal. And now as far as the benchmarks go, I decided to compare the Snapdragon 800 model with the likes of the Allview Exonic Stream, so it's a bigger version with the same CPU, the Nexus 5, 5 inch phone, Snapdragon 800, pretty close, and the Allview X2 Soul, it also has um, full HD screen and 2 GB of RAM, but a different CPU, anyway I included it for the sake of comparison. Ok, so here we go, in Quadrant we scored 18,173. We got beaten by the bigger version of the phone, the X1 Extreme, with 20,542. Nexus 5 had, last we checked, 8,600. And the Audio X2 sold 14,000 points. Next up, we got Antutu with a very good score at 39,151. The X1 Extreme had 34,000, Nexus 5 22,000, and Audio X2 sold 27,000. In Nanomark 2, 59.4 frames per second, the bigger version of this phone 61.4, Nexus 5 60.2, Allview X2 Soul 57.2. Next up we got Velamo with HTML5 test, we did better in the regular browser than Chrome, 
3255, we beat all of the other competitors, we beat the X1 Extreme with about 600 points, we beat the Nexus 5 by most more than doubling the score, and we beat the Audio X2 Soul by about 600 points. In 3D Mark, I storm unlimited 16,593, just a bit below the X1 Extreme, which is 17,125, while the Nexus 5 only beat us by about 100 points, so very close, and the Audio X2 Soul had only 7,000 points, so it doesn't even matter. This is Geekbench 3, in the single core test, 840, multi-core 2513. Meanwhile, the bigger version, X1 Extreme, 885 and 2381, Nexus 5, 871 and 2736, and finally, all View X2 Soul, 445, 2464, so we did pretty well here, I would say. In the GFX text, in the T-Rex off-screen test, 23 frames per second, the Allview X1 Extreme has 22.8, Nexus 5 22.1 and Allview X2 Soul 8.7. This is where the, it, it's been proved that there's something wrong with the Wi-Fi, we only get 14 mega per second in download via Wi-Fi and 20 in upload. Meanwhile, the X1 Extreme seem to also have a similar problem, 14 and 22, Nexus 5 8 and 20 and Allview X2 Soul 12 and 19. It appears the entire range of all views somehow offers less of a download, maybe because of the metal case. In browser mark 1379, the X1 Extreme 2397 was a different browser mark, Nexus 5 2782 once again older browser mark, and all view X2 Soul 818 the new browser mark. In Sun Spider a surprisingly good result, the lower the better, 559, X1 Extreme 601, Nexus 5 723, and AllView X2 Soul 1074, so we won this battle. Basically, the Uni U2 or AllView X1 Extreme Mini, if you want to call it that, wins 4 of the 10 benchmark battles. In spite of the benchmarks, the lag is absent here, we have pretty fluid interface as you can see, and the 3D games run like a charm, including the famous Riptide GP2. That you're seeing here loads fast looks great runs like a charm and there's no lag so a quick demo Ok, you get the idea, the game runs just fine, no problem with that, so we can run games with 3D graphics with no hassle at all. Since I mentioned games, I must mention that this bulky phone is a bit uncomfortable for long gameplay sessions, so keep that in mind if you want to play a game for an hour or half an hour, it's not exactly comfortable for your fingers being made of metal and being so thick. As far as the software goes, what we've got here is a device that runs Android 442 KitKat. It's pretty much stock, very few modifications. If you keep the menu button pressed, you'll see the multitasking area and you'll swipe around to close the apps. If you keep the home button pressed, you'll see the Google Now area and an indication that it's Valentine's Day. Next up, you don't need to keep the screen pressed to access the widgets, you only need to go to the apps area and you'll see the categories, apps and widgets here. The widgets are pretty much the stock ones and we got this dock area that can be customized by moving stuff around, swapping stuff. Next up we got the drop down area that has notifications and quick settings as usual related to brightness settings, Wi-Fi, emergency calls, auto rotate, Bluetooth alarm and location and stuff like that. Ok, so if we check out the settings area, let's check it out one more time, we got options for the sound, display, storage, battery, apps, location, security, language and input, backup and reset, date and time, so that's that. As far as the pre-installed apps are concerned, we got Bdefender Mobile Security here with a malware scanner, application audit, anti-theft, web security and event viewer. And let's see what else. We got a browser, we got a calculator, calendar, chrome, we got a compass. That's calibrated pretty okay. Next up we got uh, Google Drive, Facebook, File Explorer, 
Gmail is here, Google Plus, Hangouts and Maps. Maps that is behaving pretty much okay. This is a Snapdragon 800 device, should be no problem with such light apps. And it's very fast to localize us, especially if we activate a higher accuracy mode. Let's see what else we got here. We got, once again, maps, uh, phone, photos, the play suite, play books, play games, play music and play newsstand, plus the play store. And finally, self-care, settings, sound recorder, system updates, torch, voice search and YouTube. Those are all the apps available on this model. We also installed that cleaner. Okay, so now the verdict, the phone is called Uni U2 in China. In Eastern Europe, Romania, it's called the Allview X1 Extreme Mini. On the pro side, we have an OK battery with good standby times. Good headphones bundled with the device, premium materials used for the case, DTS sound, a very good selfie camera at the front, it's the ultra pixel camera, the main camera on the HTC One versions. Uh, this camera, the back takes OK pictures, but only OK, not stellar, not fantastic, just OK. The device offers good performance, it has a stock interface and UI without bloatware. And now on the con side, this model is bulky. It has no power saving features, the volume could be a bit higher, there is no FM radio, the screen is just ok, not exactly very good or very impressive, the video capture is poor compared to the pictures and finally there is that problem with the Wi-Fi and 3G signal. I'm going to give this model an 8 out of 10 for design, an 8 out of 10 for the hardware and a 9.2 out of 10 for the OS and UI. The final grade is 8.4 out of 10. The only things to like about this device is the performance, the selfie camera and frankly speaking the headphones. So if you want a massive metallic phone that's pretty good for games and selfies, you could buy the Uni U2. However, if you want to spare some bucks and don't want to spend $290, you can spend them on a plastic phone, a plastic phablet that has a better screen and better camera, probably the best aspects that can be improved about this model. Once again, gsno.com gives this handset an 8.4 out of 10. Bye bye.